Hello and welcome to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Efraim Martinez. I am a principal in search of wisdom and I have found productivity to be a great tool for success. Today I have the great and distinguished honor of interviewing Cynthia Schaefer, who is a lifelong student of nature and a staunch advocate for sustainable living. Cynthia's profound commitment to community service and environmental sustainability is evident in her founding of the Caring Community. This nonprofit organization supports educators while also growing food for local food banks. As a skilled herbalist, Cynthia is a fervently dedicated to educating others about the vitality of plants, the importance of biodiversity, and the roadmap to vibrant wellness. Cynthia Schaefer, who are you? Who am I? That is a fabulous question. Well, I think you pretty much covered it all in the introduction. I, I love firing people up on how they can become everything that they were meant to be. I love sharing the wisdom of plants and you know, we live on this beautiful planet with all these wonderful resources. And I love showing people how to achieve just this vibrancy through plant medicine and and eating the right kind of food for who they are. Beautiful. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. So I got to know about you because you had this awesome book titled Your Real BMI, A Better Me Index with Breath, movement and intake that is the cover so cynthia tell us what made you write up this book so i think everybody knows that bmi body mass index is something that's been used to kind of make people feel bad about themselves right you know if your bmi isn't just right you're too skinny you're too fat and that one metric really does not tell the story. In all of the traditional medicines that I've studied, you start with who are you? What is your baseline? And so we have the concept of, you know, big bone, little bone, medium bone, and the size of your frame and the just basic makeup of who you are determines how you should be going through life. And if we're going through life and we're like so focused on our weight, we're missing all of the real clues to, you know, what, what works for you? What is your best version of yourself? And it's not about weight. It's about, you know, being the best for what your body wants to do. Thank you so much. I think uh, throughout my life, uh, this has been a, a hot topic. Um, I have uh, family uh, members who uh, are, are past now, but uh, who were obese and this obesity um, uh, enigma is always being like, oh, be careful because you might become obese and this and this, but it has never been about how you feel uh, about nutrients, about being informed. Uh, so it is illuminating to read your book and learn about these things. So let me ask you specifically about the book. Uh, the traditional understanding of the BMI refers, as you said, to the body max index. But your book introduces a new perspective. Can you explain how your better me index redefines BMI and what is its significance? Sure, that's a great question. When you look at a person from, so when I, when you say the traditional BMI, that's actually the conventional BMI, better mass index. When I use the term traditional, I'm talking about the wisdom teachings that come from mm. the various traditions and whether it's Chinese medicine, Ayurvedic medicine or, you know, Native American traditional herbalism, 
they all start by looking at the body and they all use the concept of elements, right? So we've got air, ether, water, fire, air, ether, water, fire, uh, water, fire, earth, ether, and air. Right? Got it. Okay. I, took good no I took good notes. Thanks. And when you look, you have to start out by saying, what is your base element? Who are you at your base? So a lot of people that tend towards gaining weight are earth people, right? When you think of the earth, you think of solid, heavy, and it doesn't move a lot. So if someone is an earth person, then you want to make sure that they're getting fire, water, air, and ether. And you want to kind of, the reason I added a U playbook as an addition was because you really want to take the journey. You start out by finding out who are you, what is your baseline. And so I'll give you an example. I am a very fiery person. And I Me love, too. yeah, I love to play soccer, right? But soccer fires me up more. So that's the exercise or activity that comes naturally and is easy for me. But I do a lot of yoga because I need the water. I need the grounding. And I think that's kind of an important thing for people to understand is, what you love to do is something that you really want to embrace because you're going to do it a lot and that's a healthy activity but you also want to incorporate what your body needs and <clears throat> that is a really important um concept so when you when you talk about bringing in the other elements it can be through activity it can be through thoughts it can be through foods, it can be through herbs. There's a lot of different ways to look at that. Um, but the right movement for the right body makes all the difference when it comes to vibrancy and longevity. Beautiful. You know, uh, in the in the playbook, uh, you have like a, a set of questions to determine um, what is your primary element, you know, and I, I, I knew I was going to be fired. I remember I had a, an assistant who told me once, you're going to be very successful, but you better watch out because you are too fiery. You get hot too quick. And in your book, there's, a, there's this concept that you have to find that balance, the, the opposite. Yeah. So a fire, a fire will be water. What are, all, what are other examples of types of uh, elements that would be the opposite, that if they are in certain way, they need something else to have that balance? So if you look at air, right? A, a person who's suffering from an air imbalance, I like to call it squirrel. Like that's, you're easily distracted. Your mind is going everywhere. You could find yourself suffering anxiety, sleeplessness, so if you're up here in your area, what do you need? You need earth. You need to be grounded. And it's funny how a lot of people are self-medicating for anxiety, right? And they're pretty much all self-medicating with the same medicine. And the thing about that is marijuana is a leaf, right? When you look at the parts of the plant, The root is associated with earth. The stem is associated with water because it transports the water, right? The leaves are the air. The flower is the fire. And the seeds are the ether because they contain everything, right, for the next plant. So people who are suffering from anxiety, if it's an anxiety from an air imbalance, right? Too much air and they're smoking pot. They're getting a temporary reprieve, right? Because of the compounds, but they're ex making the problem worse in the long run. So 
you know, I know it, it's fun to self-medicate, right? But if you're doing it for that reason, there's a lot better things to do. And, you know, one of the most abused and abused nervine on the planet, a stimulating nervine. Can you guess what that might be that everyone drinks every day? Hmm. I cannot guess. Well, you tell me. Coffee. Ooh, I'm, I'm drinking right now. <laughs> so tell me about it. Okay, so coffee is a stimulating nervine, right? So it's stimulating the nervous system. In your case, adding fire, right? Which is great. And it's something that we could use on occasion when we need it appropriately. But if you decaf for three days, if you go three days without coffee, you'll probably get a headache if you drink a lot of coffee. But what will happen is the next time you drink coffee, it'll be magic. So one of the ways that people end up getting stuck in a rut is they become dependent on caffeine. If you break that dependency and you nourish your nervous system with things like chamomile or Tulsi or lemon balm, you're creating a healthy nervous system that's going to be even more able to respond when you, you know, have that rough night and you need that coffee. So just saying. Mm, wow. Interesting. Well, so plants, go ahead. No, no. Uh, you finish your thought. Plants have such power and we take them for granted. We, we cherry pick a few plants that are more fun, right? And we take them for granted and we'll use them but if you use the plants appropriately, you have this whole toolkit that enables you to manage your wellness so that, you know, if, if this is homeo homeostasis, this is where we're supposed to be, right? And we can just nudge back to where we want to be in our center. But if we use some of these plants wrong, we're doing this, right? Mm. That is a hard road. So understanding the magic of plants and using that magic to manage your wellness, especially educators, right? You guys are under incredible stress. And every educator I've ever met drinks a ton of coffee. And I get it. But imagine if you could be drinking things that make you healthier, make you feel vibrantly alive, and make you more resilient to the daily stresses that you're facing. Is is tea an example of uh, other or water? Uh, what do you suggest? If you if you if you had a magic wand, what would you replace coffee in schools, in the school lounges for staff? Well, actually, we did. So the caring community, one of the programs that we had, we're not doing it anymore because we didn't we did we don't have funding, but we placed self care stations in teachers' lounges. And we put in a variety of herbal teas. And we used yogi tea because it's one of the most well-known. But the herbal teas, if you have a, a black tea, that's fine. That's a little bit of caffeine. But it's a lesser amount than a cup of coffee. But, you know, there's a lot of teas that nourish the stomach. When you look at plants... Every plant works in a different part of the body. So if you take rose, okay, rose petals, for example, rose petals work in the heart and in the circulatory system. Chamomile works in the nervous system. Gotakula works in the brain, you know, circulatory system, lungs, all these things. If you simply eat a wide variety of organic, whole, plant-based foods, you're gonna get this pharmacopoeia that lives in your body. You don't need to know what your body needs because if you have enough diversity, you're gonna get what you need. And one of the best predicators of long life and health is diverse gut bacteria. Oof. 
and I know you're digging into the book, into this. I learned quite a lot. Um, let me let me let me try to go in the order of the questions because there's so much of wisdom in your book. Uh, so in your book, you emphasize the importance of breath, movement, and intake in achieving a better version of oneself. How do these elements work together to promote a holistic well-being? Perfect question. We all know that exercise especially now the new research is showing that exercise is really important for longevity and for, for general energy and health. But if you're exercising a body that does not have the components to, you know, regenerate, if it, if, so I'm going to go a little bit off on a tangent. There's a process called autophagy which is where the body basically takes the cells that aren't working properly, breaks them apart, and takes the good parts, reuses them, builds new cells. That's in a very important part of the rest and repair function. There are things that trigger autophagy, and exercising is one of them. But if you don't have what the body needs to make those new healthy cells, then you're kind of not getting it all. So you have the magic of plants, what they do for the body, and they can be creating, you know, fixing problems before you even know they exist. When you look at the anthocyanins that are in blueberries and elderberries and all your purple foods, they're scavengers. They're cleaning up any cancer cells before you know, that they come anywhere near being a problem. So you've got your food working and doing all this work, your exercise is keeping everything at its peak, and then the breath is how you control your state. So when we get excited, you know, we're talking real fast and we're breathing real fast, but then, and we just let it go. And for educators, being able to control that breath, being able to remember that breathing is a tool. Like it's, we, we never think of it about our breath, right? Unless we're out of breath. Mm -hmm. But when you start to become conscious of it, so let's say you're in a classroom situation and you know, if things are getting tense, if you start to control and slow your breathing, you'll find that the people you're interacting with begin to slow their breathing. So you have the ability to affect the entire room by just taking that breath and you want to breathe all the way down into your um, pelvic area. You really want to open up the lungs. And then conversely, if you're really out of energy, you're just totally drained, something like breath of fire, which breath of fire, fire, right? We're bringing in fire activity. Breath of fire can give you that energy without you having to drink coffee or caffeine or something that's going to you know, have a temporary effect, but then crash you back down. For sure. Thank you, Cynthia. I appreciate it. So epigenetics plays a significant role in your approach to health and wellness. How does understanding epigenetics empower individuals to take control of their health outcomes? Fabulous question. When I work with people, I so often find people who have their accepting their genetics. My mother had diabetes, my father had heart disease, whatever it is. And that used to be the way of thinking. But now we understand that we have the ability to turn a gene on or off. Let's say that your lineage has a propensity for cancer, right? Well, then knowing that, you're going to 
be eating and exercising and doing things that are going to ensure that that propensity does not become a reality. You, your story isn't written. You write your story every single day. Every choice you make writes your story. And when you're, you know, you're on a trajectory, you're on a trajectory, it's really hard to change that tra trajectory. But once you do, you know, it's a new trajectory. It changes everything. And knowing that you have that control. The other thing about epigenetics is when you look at what is hereditary, when you look at, you know, okay, heart disease runs in my family. Look at what habits you inherited from your family. You know, what is it that everyone in your family eats? What is it that everyone in your family does? You know, and, and so a lot of what people assume are genetic inheritances are lifestyle inheritances. It's so empowering what you're saying that you write your story. Yeah. And, you know, I'm a Brene Brown reader and I always thought about this in the concept of uh, self-esteem and what you do in your career and your relationships. But it was not until I read your book that it, it came to mind that I also write my story about health with the decisions that I make. Um, that is uh, uh, very empowering. Thank you, Cynthia. Uh, so environmental toxins mm. are highlighted as a significant factor affecting our health. Can you elaborate on how these toxins impact our bodies and what steps individuals can take to minimize their exposure? Absolutely. When I do consultations, I find this to be the number one area where people do not understand. When you look at the toxins in our world, a lot of them are either hormone replacers or hormone mimickers, right? So your cell is running around and it's got a specific receptor for a hormone in your body. Right. And all our systems are managed by hormones. It's not just reproductive. Um, so your cells looking for this particular hormone and a hormone mimicker, one of the toxins comes in, it fills that receptor. Now the cell is running around thinking it got what it needed, but it did not. And so you have damaged cells. When I see people who are young people with autoimmune when i see people who are having experiencing you know reproductive upsets any weight gain is a, weight gain is almost always toxicity when someone is doing all the right things and the weight is not coming off or the weight just you know comes on suddenly that is almost always toxicity because your body will attempt to sequester those toxins in your fat cells. So it'll, you know, create more fat cells. That's why when you do a detox, sometimes you can get a little ill. You have to do a detox slowly. And it rather than doing a detox, it's better to just, again, add all sorts of great food into your body. Environmental toxins are everywhere and they can be avoided. So ewg.org, that's environmentalworkinggroup.org. ewg.org will give you all the knowledge. So you can put in your products and it will tell you the toxicity levels. Some of the ones that I find really common and problematic Perfumes, right? Perfumes, um, body sprays, uh, you know, and you're putting that on your skin. So you're, that's, you know, your largest organ. You're absorbing these toxins directly. And it's ironic because these toxins, these products are meant to make you more attractive to the other, to the opposite sex. And in fact, they may be making you less 
available to the others to the opposite sex because you're not feeling well and, and it, they're affecting your reproduction. Uh, every product you buy, every ne new piece of clothing, every new piece of furniture is off gassing. When you paint your house so that you can get zero BOC paints. The reason I'm redoing my kitchen with used cabinets and countertops is not just to save money. It's because I don't want to put new products in my home. They would off gas for years. Those air fresheners, there's a, a cleanser, a floor cleaner down here that people love called Fabuloso. Mm -hmm. And that one is terrible. So it's, it's easy to get rid of these toxins, but you have to understand them. So if you go to ewg.org and you check all of your personal products, all of your cleaning products, and it'll even let you check your tap water. Wow. So let me ask you a couple of follow-up questions uh, because uh, you, you hit a couple of, uh, of spots. Let's talk about cologne and perfumes. Can you tell me more for someone like me that doesn't know about this stuff? Uh, uh, how can that negatively impact you? Um, can you elaborate on that? Sure, because when you look at the when you go to EWG and you look at the toxins in there, the they hide everything under fragrance, right? When you read, it's just going to say fragrance. Those fragrances are toxic and they cause disruption to your endocrine system. Mm. And they're also cancer risk. Wow. Wow. Um, wow. Uh, and Fabuloso. I remember uh, I'm, I'm from Puerto Rico, so everybody uses Fabuloso. Um, can you tell me more about that? Just, just pull it up. It's the same thing. It's about, in a lot of these products, it's about the fragrance right? Anything that is highly scented is most likely toxic. And if you learn about essential oils and make essential oils your friend, you will find that you can get not only a better result in cleaning, but you can also get a, excuse my chicken. I love it. I love it. I, one of my questions is about your, your home farm, but that's at towards the end. So if, if you become friends with essential oils, right? Essential oils can do amazing things, not only in cleaning, but you know you can use them as perfumes and they're a lot better for you. And I find them more pleasing. And you have a wide array of essential oils. You know, there's flower-based, there's spice-based, you know, fruit-based. Wow. Uh, this is uh, quite illuminating. Let's take a quick um, moment to recognize the Teach Better community. This podcast is a proud member of the Teach Better Podcast Network. Better today, better tomorrow, and the podcast to get you there. Explore more podcasts at www.teachbetterpodcastnetwork.com. Now let's get back to the episode. So Cynthia, let's talk about food. Your your book discusses the importance of food choices and how they can impact our health. Could you share some insights into how organic and regenerative farming practices contribute to healthier food options? Sure. It's all about the soil. When I started the, my journey into learning regenerative gardening, the first thing that I learned is about the soil web, right? So the soil web is this compilation of bacteria and fungi that break down whatever we give it and transports nutrients. It makes, the mycorrhizal network makes intelligent decisions when you look at conventionally grown food, so one of the things we do in the Karen community is we pick food that either from farms or from backyard trees and take it to food banks. 
So I went up to a conventional farm. They were donating lettuce. The lettuce looked great. It was beautiful. But the soil was completely dead. There was nothing, not, no insect. It was just no worms. It was just so completely dead. And when we monocrop, we give away a lot of the synergistic abilities that plants have to create their best version of themselves. So one of the things I do a lot is I eat weeds. So we have dollar weeds and I do that because a weed has to compete for its place and its nutrients, right? When you when a plant has to compete more for its survival, it likely has a, a higher concentration of those plant components, chemicals like um, saponins or tannins or you know whatever we're getting from that plant, it probably has a higher concentration of those when it has to work harder. Mm. A plant who is working right is creating more of those chemicals because it is making itself more resilient we'll just keep it keep it simple yes. if you think about kids right who's going to be more empowered a child that you do everything for or a child that you just hold the space for them to find their way for sure, the ones who find their way, absolutely. Yeah, so when you cultivate a healthy soil web, you create this environment where plants can get what they need and plants love to be together. Companion planting, right? Everybody has a plant friend. And when you create this, food forest, there's a place for everything and everything has understands how to get what it needs from the soil. And plants communicate above ground and below ground. So mm. above ground is chemical s signals. There's a great PBS special called What Plants Talk About. And it goes over all this it's really fascinating because the chemical signals so let's say i've got a tomato plant in the front yard that's being attacked by a tomato hornworm it's going to release a chemical signal that's going to not only call in the predators of that hornworm but also it's going to warn the tomato plants around it that the so those plants without even being eaten by the hornworm will change their composition to answer that. Plants underground know if they, if it's a sibling plant or a stranger plant. So let's say there's a, a, a weed, it looks like a daisy, right? Two daisies are side by side. If they are sibling plants, they will cooperate. If they are not sibling plants, they will compete. It's really interesting. But anyway, once I once you start me on soil, I get. But the point being, besides the the quality of the food that you're getting, it it's the way nature has always worked, right? Nobody is using a weed eater or, or leaf blower in the forest because everything has a purpose. So these nutrients fall, they're in the, the highest state, right? It's the way it's supposed to be. And no matter how much humans think they can, we have not found a better system than nature. So regenerative gardening is basically eating the way nature intended. So you're getting the best food. That food has a lot more of the not only, you know, micronutrients, but all of these plant chemicals that we don't even consider, we don't even have an, you know, a, an RMD 
for polyphenols or whatever, but we should because we need them. Wow. Where? Yes, tell me. So there's the, the theory of micronutrients basically says that this is the triage theory of micronutrients says that if you are deficient, the body will prioritize immediate functions over long-term functions. This is why you, if you look around in our society, you're seeing people in their 30s, 40s, and 50s, and they're getting these cascades of illnesses. 40% of the um, United States citizens have a chronic disease. No, 60% have a chronic disease. 40% have two or more chronic diseases. That's wow. all lifestyle. Chronic diseases are all lifestyle. And that doesn't mean that if you have a chronic disease, you should feel bad because it's not your fault. We live in a society that does not understand how wellness works. We've forgotten and our systems have given us these things that are not good for us. But when you grow up in a world and you look around the world and everyone is doing these things and eating these foods, how can you know that that's what's ultimately killing you? I mean, it's like um, we live in a society that is destined to give us foods, especially like, and you address this in your book, um, an organic I item is more expensive than an ultra processed item, but therefore it causes all these diseases, especially in the population that cannot afford uh, or have access to health. And so it's a perfect system uh, for an imperfect society. Um, you talk about the interest of the lobbyist um, on making sure that this doesn't change. Can you elaborate on that? If you look at the farm subsidies, we subsidize corn. Uh, corn is, you know, perfectly fine plant. It has lutein. It has good things, but we've subsidized it to the point that. And, you know, I know a little about a lot, so, I, I, you know, we've subsidized it so that everyone is using corn. What is corn made into? Corn syrup. All your sweeteners, most of your sweeteners in processed foods are corn-based, and they're corn-based because we grew so much corn that we had to find a place for it. If you were to take corn out of our system, it would eliminate a, a vast majority of the processed food. There is, so I wanna talk about sweet for a minute. I wanna yeah. talk about flavors. The way the body works, everything starts on the tongue, right? The tongue is tasting Sweet, sour, salty, bitter, spicy. If you're, if you were to sit down with a jar of honey and just take spoonfuls of honey, your tongue would taste the honey. Your gut would send a signal, much like what the Ozempic products are doing, it would send that signal that says, okay, we've had enough of that. And you would no longer, you'd be satiated, right? You'd be, you'd be done. Same with salty, same with spicy, same with bitter. We've engineered our foods to bypass that. Well, <sighs> nacho cheese Doritos or the demon food. I'm probably going to get sued like crazy. <laughs> <laughs> but nacho cheese Doritos are scientifically engineered to have the exact blend of those five flavors so that your tongue does not get the signal 
and does not send your gut does not send the shut off but you know signal when you're eating processed foods you really don't have you're getting sugar fat and salt right when you're eating processed foods mm -hmm. bitter is a flavor that very few of us experience on a regular basis so what's the importance of flavors in when you talk about your body well bitter is the flavor that tells the digestion fire up let's go it releases bile it starts the digestive um, process bitters are really good for you nobody does bitters anymore people think nobody. kale is bitter you know they've never really experienced bitter <laughs> but once you get off those processed foods right the ch it's challenging okay it is challenging for people especially you know you've got jobs you got families you got all these things how do you transform from this you know easy to use process system to whole foods and when you look at the cost Eventually, you know, after a, a, a couple of weeks, you get full on a lot less food because you're actually getting nutrition. So if you're using quinoa and amaranth and, you know, so many different kinds of beans and lentils and peas and greens, you know, greens are, have been a staple food for millennia because they they work, right? They're good for you. They're easy to grow. When you begin this process of eating real food, not only will you feel better, and maybe not right away because you've got all of those systems that aren't working properly yet. You know, one of the major complaints that I see people is constipation. You know, we, we can't sleep without help. We can't digest without help. We can't eliminate without help. We can't have sex without help. I mean. Happy. We cannot be happy without help. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's. To me, it's amazing that you can look around the world and, and there's clear evidence that everything is going wrong and that it is the root of it is our food system. And yet we're stuck with it. Well, our, our vegan processed foods any better than regular uh, non-vegan processed foods? As a vegetarian, I think that the value of a vegetarian or vegan diet is that you're getting a lot more plants. But I see a lot of what we call pasta and potato vegetarians, which means they are eating pasta, bread, potatoes. You know, vegan does not mean healthy. It simply means there's no animal products. And even in the, the you know, like Morningstar, Boca Burgers, those things, that's still processed foods. And if you get the, there's an app called Yuka, Y-U-K-A, and there's others like that, but Yuka is the one I know. Yuka allows you to scan the barcode in the grocery store, and it'll tell you right then and there about additives and um, sugar and salt content, things like that. It's a great tool to help you get rid of, you know, some of these processed foods that are, are, are the worst. But yeah, and what you choose to eat is not nearly as important as the quality of what you choose to eat. So for example, meat, we talked about the, the plant chemicals, right? The phytonutrients, a free range piece of beef will have phytonutrients in it because that animal is free ranging. When I watched my chickens, I, I didn't know that chickens ate so many greens, but my chickens wander the yard and they pick this 
weed and that weed and grab a grub and you know it, it's amazing so those eggs that i'm getting from those chickens are also full of phytonutrients mm. so it's back to quality and there are so the then the next question is how do you get that quality right i mean it's it's not in your grocery store and if it is in your grocery store it's probably not affordable there are co-ops there are food gardens like you can rent a community garden um plot in a lot of places even if all you do is you bring a pot of fresh herbs into your home and grow them on a windowsill you're still getting that beginning under like there's a connection between you and the plant and right. yeah the reason i did the parsley sage rosemary and thyme was just to show how one herb you know one herb has all this magic in it and the more you add these into your routine even if you're just having a cup of rosemary tea you know it's amazing what it does for you well, you talk about uh, uh, herbs, uh, for example, rosemary, and I was my wife is called rosemary. So I have an issue with uh, high blood pressure, um, and I know that you know we have to make sure that everybody knows that we are not medical doctors and we're not um, uh, giving any um, medical advice. Um, that said, um, you give several examples of different herbs that lower blood pressure. And I know that is an issue with many educators. Um, what uh, suggestions do you have of things that, uh, on how we can in, in, um, um, involve those type of uh, herbs, like for example, rosemary uh, into uh, what we intake? There's a lot of different ways. You know, a cup of tea is a really simple thing. You can make a cup of tea out of any herb, right? So thyme, for example, thyme is really good in the sinuses. If you have a sinus infection, start drinking a couple cups of thyme tea, rosemary tea, and then put those fresh herbs in your salad, put those fresh herbs in your eggs. In the morning, I have herbs. You know, I, I take my pan, I put in my coconut oil, and I put fresh herbs, and then I cook the eggs on top of it. There's... I, you can just walk by a rosemary plant, grab a couple of sprigs and put it in you know, your mouth and, and it's lovely. Mint tea is a great thing. When it comes to blood pressure specifically, exercise is your best friend. Um, and again, as you bring all these foods into your body, your body begins to use those because it's all about systems, right? We are using all this reductionist thinking and we're applying it to systems, but the system is greater than the sum of its parts, right? The magic that happens in the garden, it's inexplicable, right? But it happens. The magic that happens in our bodies, it, it's not about you know, this one thing or, or this other thing, it's about all of it together. And the more, you know, if you have one system that's not, like, like your circulatory system is not functioning well, that's gonna impact the rest of your body. So you wanna work on, it's not rocket science, it's your foundation is your food, right? What you're bringing in, that's building your house. And if that house is starting to break down, you got to bring in more different building parts, different components. I always tell people, if you go into the grocery store and you see something that you've never eaten before, and it's, you know, fresh and it's, and it's good quality, get it, try it. The box is like, um, misfits. Are you familiar with misfit market? No, no. 
hopefully they're still out there. Basically, they you can buy a box of what they call ugly food, right? But it's organic. And they send you this box of ugly food every couple of weeks. And you're forced to learn what to do with it. And there's all these foods. Like, turnips are amazing. All these foods that we just have forgotten about. Wow. Thank you so much, uh, Cynthia. You know, uh, I'm, uh, I love history and you uh, mentioned in the book about the idea of victory gardens. And I mm. think that this is a fascinating uh, uh, thing uh, that in, uh, started with the end of the First World War. Uh, how can individuals incorporate the principles of victory gardens into their lifestyles to improve their access to nutrition foods? I'm a big believer in group gardening. So it, it, schools, clearly, you know, are, are a great opportunity. I know there's a lot of school gardens down here. There's, if you have a faith group, maybe there's space where the, the faith community is. I'm in a densely urban area. So for us, you know, finding space is a bit of a challenge. The concept of regenerative gardening or food forest gardening makes growing food so much easier. So up there, you can probably grow what? Apples, plums, pears, peaches, cherries. Um, there's a, oh, can't remember the name, but it kind of tastes like a mango. When you, so if you start by just if you have a home, put in a couple of fruit trees. Why would you not have a fruit tree if you could? I only have a third of an acre and it's, you know, part in shade and I got the chicken coop. I have over 20 fruit trees plus berry bushes. If you give up the concept of, of a lawn, because what does a lawn really do for you? Um, and you take part of your of your property and you just turn it into a food forest. And if you Google food forest or regenerative gardening, you're gonna find all sorts of resources and ideas. Um, and then you can also look for a CSA. So if, let's say you're not you're not able to grow your own food. Community supported agriculture is another great way to get you know, your food on a regular basis. You can look to volunteer if there's a nearby food bank garden. So we get a lot of volunteers because they're looking to learn how to do it themselves. So they come in and they volunteer with us for a little bit. You can, it, it, you can talk to your neighbors and say, hey, I'm going to plant a pear tree. Why don't you plant an apple tree? It's all about changing the way you think about food and gr things like greens and, you know, up there probably beets, potatoes. Potatoes are super easy to grow. You, you put them in the, you, know, you, you buy some potatoes that are starting to get the little, you know, little sprouts. You cut them up. You let them dry for a couple of days, stick them in the ground. In a few months, you have a bunch of potatoes. So, you know, things like that. Love it. Thank you so much. Uh, Cynthia, in the book, you mentioned the role of mindfulness and meditation in promoting overall well-being. How can individuals integrate these practices into their daily lives to support their health goals? I love the saying, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. So it's all about how you approach a task. And are you fully present there? Are you, when you're experiencing, for example, mindful eating is a great practice. I'm guilty of, you know, picking up a book and putting down a plate of food. And before I know it, the food's gone. I don't remember eating it, but it was a good book. Yes. So, Yes. Mindful eating, 
you are a good practice, for example, is putting your fork down between each bite. So you're experiencing that bite. You're when as you get in more into mindfulness, you will be able to tell when that food is good for your body or not good for your body. And cravings go away. So a friend of mine is every year for Valentine's Day, we make cookies for a special needs class. And we get together for a few hours and we frost cookies and we put all sorts of terrible things on these cookies. <laughs> and everybody's like, why aren't you tempted, Cynthia? And I'm not tempted because I haven't had white sugar in ages. And when I do eat white sugar or, you know, anything with processed, it just takes my energy down in, in a matter of minutes. And then I feel terrible. It affects my mood. So once you get past that, it's not like you're looking at a life of deprivation where you're, you're constantly wanting things. It's, it's the exact opposite. You're living this life where you love the things that fire your body up, that make you feel good, that make you work well as a human being. And you don't have those cravings. You don't have that desire and need for those things that are going to be bad for your body. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Wow. Um, any, um, any, what are your thoughts on the sugar and that everything has sugar and what can we do uh, uh, to move away and perhaps having a sugar free life? Well, sugar I find is frequently a mineral craving. One of the things I tell people is if you get some organic blackstrap molasses and when you have that sugar craving, have just like a half a spoonful of blackstrap molasses and chances are it'll go away. Dates. So dates are a great way to get that sweetness. Raisins, right? Cinnamon. Nature provides honey. Nature provides a lot of sweetness. And you want to remember that when we were evolving, that when we ran across that much sweetness that was we would you know run into a maybe a piece of you know so a fruit tree once every three months and we would pig out so you have to recognize that there's that um you know compulsion and and when that compulsion comes answer it with dates or something like that is honey okay in tea or honey should be away from tea honey i, I mean i i like honey and tea the only thing that You want to be aware of it. if it's raw organic honey and the tea is really hot, then you're losing some of the um, viability of the enzymes. So oh. you, you might want to wait until the tea is a little cooler. Okay, great advice. Um, lastly, about your book, um, you emphasize on the importance of self-love and acceptance. How can individuals cultivate a mindset of self-care and prioritize their well-being in today's fast-paced world? Well, if you think about it, the greatest act of love you can do for someone else is to love yourself. Because if you're not taking care of yourself, you're not able to be fully present for the people that depend on you. And at the end of the day, We live in this world where the best thing we can do for the world is find our highest expression. Because when you're living your highest expression, you are giving the gift that the world needs. And when I look around at the people I see, they're not living their highest expression. And that's sad for them. And it's sad for the rest of us because you don't know what's inside of you, what you have to give until you really, really, really find everything that you are. And you can't do that if you're not operating at peak wellness. Beautiful. Cynthia, what an honor to have you in the show. Let me ask you one more question. Uh, super interested in learning more about your home garden. Can you tell us... Um, Like how to start 
right? Because like I have seen your videos in, in YouTube uh, and and it's so lovely, but I wouldn't know where to start. So can you tell us your 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 origin story and how your home garden um, started uh, and uh, the tribes and tribulations until you got where you're at right now? Well, I see we're at an hour. So you tell me if I have to, to cut it short. But it starts with find a plant that you love and plant it. When I wrote a, a small book called Food Studying, that kind of takes you through the process step by step. But basically you want to look at your yard or your space as a forest. So what would the forest do? That's my whole motto. What would the forest do? Well, the forest starts with big trees. So what are your big trees? You know, a big fruit tree, right? And then there's smaller trees. So there are smaller fruit trees here, for example, bananas and papayas are our smaller fruit trees. And then under that, you've got berry bushes. Remember, soil never likes to be naked and plants like friends. So you've got the trees, the bushes, you've got vines that can, you know, run up those trees. You've got all that space for ground vegetables. So your root vegetables serve the purpose of breaking up the soil and also pulling nutrients up, right? So comfrey. Comfrey is a great plant that you can grow. It's not edible, but it is medicinal topically. And it's a great chop and drop. And chop and drop is a plant where you grow it mostly because you're going to give it back to the soil. Comfrey is a great chop and drop because it is a um, dynamic accumulator. It pulls the nutrients from deep in the soil, pulls them up into the leaves, and then those leaves fall on the ground and, and feed. Your herbs generally serve as great companion plants, but you can do a rosemary hedge. Like, go out in your, in your space and look around if you have whatever plant you have there, so let's say you just have an ornamental bush, go and sit beside it. Just put your hand on the leaf. Maybe, you know, hold on to the stem. Try to connect with it, you know? And then try to imagine what it would be like if you wanted to walk out your front door or your back door. What would you want nearby. So my, a lot of my herbs are in the front. So when I'm cooking, I can just run out and get them. There's a mulberry bush real close to my back door because mulberry I eat every day. You have the ability to connect with these plants. You have the ability to know what it is that your body wants. And sooner or later, those plants will talk to you and your system will become an extension of you. And you will go out there every day and wander through it just because it brings you joy. And you'll begin to think, oh, I should plant X here. That would be good. And it's an ever evolving thing. It's not static. So it's just a part of your daily life. Wow. Cynthia, thank you so much for being in the show. I enjoyed it so much. You are such a wonderful person. <laughs> thank you so much. Uh, go online and get the book. It is titled, Your Real BMI, A Better Me Index with Breath, Movement, and Intake. Uh, it's a fascinating read. I have learned so much. And Cynthia, thank you so much. Have a fantastic weekend. You too. Thank you for listening to Wisdom and Productivity, the podcast of Dr. Eparin Martinez. Chulo. And I love that production. Chulo out. <laughs>